Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to episode 13 of the second season of the Biotensegrity Party, uh, organized by the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive. Today's guest is Marin Deal, who will be talking about evolving tensegral potential. I'm Susan Lowell de Solorsino from the United States Colony of Washington, D.C. And I'm Graham Scar from Nottingham in the UK. And I'm Chris Morita Clancy, coming to you from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish Nation, just outside of Vancouver, B.C. And it's our intention to promote and share biotensegrity, the biotensegrity concept with as many people as possible and to include all of you in that mission, those of you here on Zoom and those of you who are joining us on YouTube. The Biotensegra Tea Party is an all-volunteer production of the Stephen M. Levin Biotensegrity Archive. We're a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to educate, to raise public awareness, and build community in the field of biotensegrity, and to foster and forward discovery, research and understanding in the fields of health, science, and medicine. Thanks, Chris. And as ever, we are grateful to our team of volunteers, Mariana Barreto from Mississauga, Ontario. Hello, hello. And Gwen Cornish from Creston, British Columbia. It looks beautiful there, Gwen. And Neo Cortex Elbe from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hey, Neo. Hi, tea partiers. And Lisa Babiak from St. Albert, Alberta, Canada. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Lisa, it looks like summer there. It looks tropical. <laughs> In my house, yes. Outside, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to toast my great friend, Maren Diel, who is coming to us from Germany and... I want to just say that, you know, when I was writing my book, Everything Moves, I thought, okay, we have Graham's book, we have uh, Daniel Claude Martin's book, so maybe mine is the third book on biotensegrity. And then what I realized is actually mine was the fourth book on biotensegrity because when I actually read Maren's book, it is, it, I guess, because there's a horse on the cover and I don't ride horses, although I think they're wonderful. Um, I thought it's not really about biotensegrity, it's about horses. And I was so wrong. And as somebody who um, has been practicing Tai Chi for near to 40 years, uh, it's amazing to me how the connection, her discussions of the connection of body to body, respectful, attentive contact between rider and horse relate to the partner work we do in Tai Chi. So it's all about biotensegrity folks. Get it if you don't have it. And I'm going to toast Mara Deal. So thank you. And I'm very glad to be here tonight. Yes. 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 Um, Graham's gonna give us a little info about our sponsors. Yes, thank you, Susan. Uh, we'll start with Handspring Publishing in East Lothian, Scotland. We have a wide range of authors and books available for movement and manual therapy professionals. And you'll have seen lots of uh, our authors presented on the Biotensegrity Tea Parties over the last year. They also produce a free newsletter giving details of their webinar series with Elizabeth Larkham. Next, we have Embodied Biotensegrity with Chris Marita Clancy in Vancouver, British Columbia. We provide an excellent resource for those of you looking to learn more about biotensegrity. Thefasciahub.com. We're organizing a full day event entitled The Fascial Foot tomorrow, Saturday the 8th. With speakers John Sharkey, Wilbur Kelsick, Elizabeth Larkin, Philip Beach, and Rachel Tudor. Moving on, we have the Second World Fascia Congress, which is going to be held in from Brazil um, on the August 12th to the 15th. I think booking is available now and a discount coupon on the discount details in the chat, which all the details are sure. in the chat. Yeah, I'm not sure we have a discount. I think it's pretty inexpensive already. All so, right. um, but, but thank you. Yes. Sorry. 
Didn't yeah, that's mean fine. To cut you off. That's fine. Uh, we have integrated biotensegrity in Alberta, Canada with Lisa Babiak, who runs regular courses. Matrix repatterning with George Roth, who runs courses for manual therapy professionals. Pretense in Holland, who produce a wide range of tensegrities for sale. And Artifact Pro in Madrid, Spain, with anatomically inspired tensegrity models. So look for details in the chat. And I think that's it for now. Back to you, Susan. Yeah, and I think we have new this week. I got, um, Steve, you'll love this. I got email from Bruce Hamilton. Oh, great. And, yeah, and so he has made a few models that are like the one Chris has with chopsticks and these um, glass ball floats that are found on the beach. They're from Japanese um, fishing nets. And then they, they find them on the beach sometime in the West Coast. Anyway... Uh, he's got a few of those that he's put together and some others. So I think we're putting contact information there in the chat. Um, Bruce has some very special models as well. Um, great. So thank you, Graham. And before we go over to Maren, uh, Steve is going to, has asked to um, say a few words. This is the time when post toast, we, um, turn off our cameras and uh, we're gonna spotlight Steve, maybe. Yeah, I'm here. All right, over to you, Steve. And then we'll okay, go to Marin. I, I, He's done. Right, I, I don't wanna eat into Marin's time, uh, but I feel I would be remiss if I didn't correct a misstatement that John Sharkey made three or four weeks ago. Uh, and uh, I hope John is here so he, he could hear it directly. Um, he was adamant um, about this concept of stretching and that it could only be interpreted one way and that stretching equal tearing and tearing is bad. And I don't want to argue with the merits of stretching uh, at this time. It takes too long, but I, I'm more concerned with the dogma dogmatic way it was presented because biotensegrity is a science where uncertainty is the norm and you just have to live with it. So the easiest way to, to tell you what it's all about is if you grab a glass in your hand, and I've done these things before with you, and squeeze, all right? You've just performed an isometric, meaning the muscles stayed the same length, contraction of your forearm muscles, but they didn't contract, they expanded. So contraction of a muscle is really an expansion of a muscle, which screws up the dictionary de definition of all these things. And if you grab onto your arm and feel those forearm muscles, you find that the so-called flexors and the so-called extensors are both working. So they're not flexing and extending, they're co-contracting. So what you have to recognize is that, that uh, dictionary definitions that have been in place for 200, 300 years don't count anymore. You have to rethink all these subjects. And I will tell you that I, I think this whole stretching concept has to be re rethought. But the more important part of it is that we can't make those dogmatic statements on this uh, forum because biotensegrity is not allowed for it. Not just me, biotensegrity. And that's and back to Mara now. Or back to me, actually. Sorry. Or right, back to you. <laughs> okay. So so here's what we're gonna do. Um uh we have solidly booked up the tea party episodes through June, and we're gonna take July and August off, I believe. So but we don't want to let the matter sit. And there's been we've been getting a lot of um email and other communications about the, the subject. So we're gonna start a little short-term big a biotensegrity interest group around the subject of stretching. So we'll have some closed meetings, probably on Zoom um, here and there, a couple of them, whatever's necessary, two, three, to at least identify what the issues are. And so we invite you to join us for that. Um, in the chat, uh, we're gonna put a link to a Google form and you can jump in 
and you can fill it out and then we'll get in touch and we'll jump into, I really look forward to the discussion. We'll share our sources and our concerns and all of that. Sounds good? All right. So I'm going to now uh, turn it over to Marin. And I hope whoever whoever's watching on YouTube um, is got the view the way we want it because I am seeing Steve Big and Marin Little. Marin, say something. Maybe that'll trigger the yes, switch. I'm, I'm using... <laughs> I'm using... There we go. Okay. okay. So Marin, I I... Susan, can I jump in? May I? Yeah, please, please do. May I put the Google form link into the Zoom? I mean, onto the YouTube channel so people who are watching on YouTube can yeah. also join us? Yeah, okay, absolutely. Great. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Okay, Marin, I'm just going to turn it over to you because you know what you're doing and what you're about much more than I. <laughs> I hope I know. <laughs> I did my very best to bring everything together. So I'm a practitioner in the field of wild integrity, and I founded my work with horses and riders on biotensegral principles uh, since 2015 when I met Danielle Claude Martin. Uh, biotensegrity is the model of my choice when it comes to horse training, physical work, or martial arts. And, excuse me, uh, excuse me one second, Marin. I think you are covering your microphone. Uh, I don't know if you have something covering because we could oh. hear you before better than what we can hear you now. So maybe, uh, maybe there is a paper or something on your computer that is covering the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> sure <laughs> not. Maybe I have to talk a little bit louder. That sounds better, doesn't it, Mariana? Yes, it know. does. It does, yes. Okay. Sorry, I will yeah. shout at you a little bit. <laughs> so, okay. Um, during my life, I experienced again and again how powerful changes happen when I found a new way of thinking or sent my, um, my thoughts on a new path and created new images of motion. And that was not about positive thinking or affirmations. And from my nowadays perspective, I'd say that I always went through a creative process and found a phrase, new meta concept, which included insights and in anatomy as well as feel and experiences. So I wrote about biomechanics from the horse's side in my first book and already found some principles of biotensegral beha behavior I had no name for at that time because I didn't know about biotensegrity. Uh, but I found some of the principles and uh, the results of using these meta concepts in my work with horses seem to be sort of magic because you couldn't see what actually happened. And my, um, so it was no matter what field, horses or martial arts or my own health, it was sort of magic because my own health issues, Achilles tendon, knee and shoulder at different times in my life were each solved from one day to another just because I found and integrated another piece of knowledge and a new understanding. And horses moved in a completely different way and their whole conformation sheet seemed to have changed from one moment to the other. And usually you would say the conformation of a horse is about genes, but to my opinion, it is 95% training and, uh, and the model you base the training on and uh, only 5% genes because the bones are nearly the same in every horse. 
So preparing this presentation, I nearly got lost in the huge net of interactions between the body and the mind, standing and thinking, behavior and habits, models and principles, paths and connections. I really got lost in the sphere of possibilities. So I decided to bring it all together and show you the process of creating meta concepts. Um, I think many of you are therapists or trainers, and you'll know that it is possible to change a person's or a horse's motion pattern with one insight, experience, or image. But that is not always possible, and it's always a little bit of luck and fate when it happens. So. If this is our profession and we want to repeat the process intentionally and we want to know where the bugs are, it might be helpful to know how to create meta concepts. They should be clear, free of contradictions, include all areas inside, outside, action and reaction, feel and knowledge, observation and experience, body and mind. So we want to have it all. Um, and these concepts enable us to send and receive a full set of information in no time. I don't know how this, info how this information is passed back to magic. Um, I just know that it works and that it is not about the words we choose in training or therapy or about the VAs the horse gets. So at first, now I'll explain along the diagram that Susan will share on the screen, the first one. All right, just a second. And after that, you will learn how this diagram works the other way around and how it works with horses and horse training. Let's see, that's not the right that's one. That's not my diagram. <laughs> no, let me try that again. <laughs> da, 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 da. There's this, there's my share. How about that? Yeah, that's great. So I thought there's no use in discussing every method and, and uh, technique for, to get a change. So how can we make big changes in the main setting? And um, so we start in the middle and go to the right. We choose a model. And this model, I think, um, it is like entering a new world. And it's a new start if we choose a new model. But luckily, we have all managed to choose the model biotendegrity already. Uh, so we don't have to question that at the moment. So we have our model and the next step is to find out what that means and define the underlying principle, like no compression between bone surfaces and the ground reaction forces are your friends, believe it or not. Energy is stored in the structure and not in the material itself. So we find these principles and if we accept these principles we found, we are able to put some rules in words. The rules the body should follow in the interaction with the environment. These rules are basic, clear, and contradiction-free rule. And we are at the next point, the algorithm. To my opinion, it's important to put it in simple words like never give up your body's integrity or answer pressure with pressure or let your opponent push the earth. So not too much if, when, then, maybe, if, um, it must be clear. And the body is able to follow these algorithms in all situations. And this will change behavior at all scales and fields Following different rules means to behave different in any interactions, people, gravity, horses, tools, ground, whatever. And it might have consequences for relationships and discussion style as well. 
and your habits will change too and so will experience it depends on our habits as we look for and create new experiences of our liking or if we endure other people's setup and these new experiences um, give us the chance to make a full circle and find our new complex motion field image, our new metacorpus. And in the beginning, I said I talk about magic and meta concepts cause these magic moments when suddenly everything falls in the right place. And in the same way, we can check existing concepts. So we can create new meta concepts and we can check other people's concepts if they are or might become meta concepts or if they are just crazy share picks. And then we start with the question, what model or par paradigm belongs to this concept? Which are the principles? What are the algorithms? And what is the result if we use these algorithms? Um, and in most cases, we find that there are contradictions in itself or to our own paradigm. But this is a very easy way to check if it's worth to go on with discussion because when the model is wrong and we don't want to use that model, we don't have to use this concept and we don't have to think about that. Part. Okay, and um, I made another diagram, a second one, Susan, please. Let's see. Yes, thank you. Um, and that's a funny one because it was not my intention to do it like that, it just happened. But it shows a funny thing because we come from theory with the model and the principles and the, uh, putting the algorithms in words from the theory part to real life where we uh, live that. So one side, we go down the rabbit hole for, of theory and science. And on the left side, we live real life and we make experiences and we get results. And the algorithm, algorithms are the software that runs our system. And if there is a bug in the software, the whole system can crash. And I think that happens uh, with horses all the time. And there is no, um, no sense in discussion, single aid or elections. It's the whole system we have to question in that way the diagram shows. Um, and to my opinion, real life can prove or disprove the correctness of paradigms, principles, and algorithms. So we have to watch the results and we have to realize if these are the results we want to get or if they are different uh, from our intention. And uh, so this is mainly how I think it is practical and later I can show you how to check writing styles with this script but for now I think it's time for your questions. Well, actually Maren if you wouldn't mind I think having an example like that where you have a real life uh, use of the chart if you wouldn't mind talking us through it while we are able to see this really fascinating um, kind of mind map that you've made for us. Would you mind? I feel okay, like I can. 
because I feel like if we go to questions, we'll never get to it. And I really, I think it's great to see how you've applied it. Okay. So, um, if I'm see a horse or if someone asks me how, what to do with that horse and how to work that horse or someone tells me um, what, what um, riding style is used or I always ask for the, for the, for the model and it's almost all mechanics or at least the the uh, liver based body organi organization. Um, and if that is the model, and I try to find the principles, I almost have at that point already contradicting principles because the horse has to use um a lot of lot lots of force and strength to use these levers the rider thinks the horse has to use and on the other hand the rider wants the horse to yield to the bit or from the bit i don't know um so the horse has to do two things two different things at the same time that don't go together. Mm -hmm. That is the first point where I would say, okay, this method, this model doesn't work. And when we go further, we can check the algorithms. If we can make general uh, algorithms for the horse, how to use its body from these principles. And um, there we come to the point that it, it's impossible because it doesn't make sense to be a strong horse and yield the pressure of the bit and to lever the front from the hind. If you put it in words like this, it can't work. And from there, you can see where does it lead and to what behavior does it lead? And there we have two possibilities usually. The one behavior is to give in or give up and um, don't do more than really afford it. And the other one is to struggle. And so we have from, from that behavior, we have the experience that carrying a rider is frustrating. And so the horse yeah, the, the struggle or um, go the easiest way, which is not yeah. the best way for the horse. Almost like fight or flight. It, it's more like fight or freeze. I think fight or freeze. Uh, fight we, or freeze. Great. Horses are more sure. frozen, and yeah. maybe some are a flight is also possible. But many many horses are just collapsed and frozen. Yeah. And I've also heard fight or flight or freeze or appease. I mean oh, that there are yeah appease. Kind of like give in to the will of the other person in order to take the issue off the table, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like giving up on the self mm, yeah. without keeping your own healthy structure. So you give over. <laughs> yeah. 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 So then that leads to the new complex. So that that is so you identify a problem this way. With this chart and then yes, I, can, I, I yeah. can identify problems but before I think about the problems I, I can realize in the very beginning that there is no use thinking about it further because it's based on the wrong paradigm yeah and the principles make no sense and the principles um, 
don't don't match uh, reality and physics. So I don't, usually I wouldn't talk through the whole map because at the point model or latest principles is done. Right, so you get that far and there's no reason to go through the rest of the loop. You can yeah. just say, okay, this is not working. I need to go back and to, and to the top where I'm going to, um, or go back to the center where I'm going to come up with a new model. I think we have to uh, see the difference between someone tries to convince me from his way of working a horse. Then you, usually there is uh, an end of discussion with model. And yeah. on the other hand, if I try to find a new meta concept, of course I will check my model and I will check the principles and I will have a look what new algorithms I can find based on this model and these principles to go further. Great. Okay, maybe what I do now is stop my share. Mm -hmm. And ah, one, one thing I have, uh, I have made this uh, diagram in a nice colored version and uh, Chris can put it into the chat and you can download it if you want it, print it out. Thank you. Very, very, very generous and so interesting. And so I think I want to ask you about um, a model versus a metaphor. Now I need to look at your chart again. Uh, that, that basically, because I think of a metaphor as being uh, one of these, as being a model. Do you use it that way? Would you agree with that? What, what, what do I use as a model? A, a metaphor, a metaphor like in Taiji will say, stand like a mountain and move like a great river. And that so- would be an algorithm. So you would consider the metaphor is the algorithm yes. that- and the, that, and the model is, uh, like the model of biomechanics or the model of biotensegrity. So in this case, we have two models and maybe if we go to philosophy, we have other models we can choose. Okay, so when we have an effective metaphor, it functions like an algorithm. It makes sense to me yeah. because yeah. we can always come back to it and it always works. Yes, yeah. it's like what I said before, um, if you make your opponent uh, push the earth when he pushes you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you don't have to think which bone were, which joint what. It's, it's just, it, it comes by itself. Right. Use that algorithm. <clears throat> Great. Oh, that's wonderful. Yep, that makes sense. So yeah, are you talking about the the um, experiential that I have in my book, or because I have it in my book where it's sort of like I'm taking a step and I'm pushing down with a foot and I'm thinking, okay, I'm pushing on the earth and the earth is pushing back at me, and it's a way to develop a sense of ground reaction force. Yes. So so an experiential or an exercise or a practice can be an effective algorithm, would you say? Yes, you could also say, um, I use the ground reaction force, I use the ground, uh, the, the force of the earth without hurting me or the earth. Without hurting? Hurting myself or the earth. Ah, right, right, right. With, without anyone getting hurt. <laughs> Uh, on either side of the exchange. Yeah. 
The earth That's great. treats you as you treat the earth. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting into your um, permaculture life. <laughs> Because um, not everyone knows you're Wing Chun uh, trained. So you have martial arts training and you've also, you do a lot of work with gardening and permaculture and um, as well as work with horses. And I think that all of these uh, would relate to finding, finding efficient, effective solutions that work that involve harmony across uh, all that, you know, all, fully across the spectrum. Do I have that right? Yes, and I think with horses, it's important that they know their job and that they can do something and not have to um, endure it. So I think with people, it's, it's the same in, in life. When I can do something, when I'm able to, to act, everything is far easier as if I'm just sitting there and I don't know what to do or I can't do anything. Right. Yes. I was thinking with people too, right? Yeah. When we have a sense of purpose, when we, when we have that clarified um, yeah. and in, in, uh, in Taiji, we talk about how the E leads the Chi and the Chi leads the body. The intending mind leads the kind of mm, helps you generate what you need for the energy patterns, the internal uh, configurations and, and that and leads the body into making the right choices there. And so you don't need to know about specific parts. Yes, and the better the algorithms are, the less leading by the mind is needed. Yes, you can you can kind of relax. The algorithms over. are the software. Yes, that's great. You know, Leonid. Um, in his discussions about um, kinematic indeterminacy talks about the body as being like the black box, right? Mm -hmm. Where, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. So instead of the gray box where we have some ideas about mechanical things or whatever that might be going on within, um, we have to recognize that the, that's based on a lot of assumptions and that what it really is is a black box uh, because when when an external force comes to bear on the body, for example, we can't know exactly the pathways through um, that that force takes. Just like if somebody steps on um, ublek, right, the cornstarch and water and it jackets, we can't know exactly the force patterns of that moment. Uh, mm -hmm. all across the surface of the of the oobleck. So uh, I am thinking that the black box relates to what you're calling magic. Yes, I think that that really relates because no one knows what what's in there and why there's coming out what's coming out. Um, and what you said about that um, Good algorithms always allow uh, um, many, many solutions. They never say what's the way. They don't they give the rules for action, but they are independent from, um, from the situation. They work in every situation. Yeah, so they're independent from a specific strategy because then you have to go down a rabbit hole of if this happens, then do this. Yeah. But if that yeah. happens, then do this. And since the uh, range of possibilities is always nearly infinite, yeah. that's 
a really inefficient way to to uh, to try to solve a problem in terms of movement or or action. And so if you can just get an effective algorithm, you can just apply that, works every time, and you don't have to wallow in the cerebral specifics. Yeah. That's great. And Leonid's going to be presenting on something very related to this in a few weeks. So that's, ah, okay. that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, um, I love his example. I think it came from him. The example with the um, rabbit and the dogs. Uh, so uh, that, the, with the that little that, house? That an artificial system yes. collapses if the, the number of problems is rising too far and living systems never slow down when the number of problems rises. The rabbit doesn't become slower because there are more dogs. <laughs> that's and great. That's what artificial intelligence does. Gives they us calculate more. more and more and more and more and more options and they don't have enough time to choose and they are eaten by the dogs. Oh, that's great. Okay, I think um, we've got a number of people who, who want to ask questions. Um, Chris, do you want to um, come on camera and unmute yourself? Hi, thanks. And thank you, Maren. I always love listening to you. Now, quite a while ago for Biotin's Security Book Club, we read your book. And I remember everybody there was blown away because as Susan was saying, we see this picture of the horse on the cover and it's not until we start reading the book that we realize how relevant it is to us as people and how, I mean, I, I've only a few times in my life sat on a horse, but what you are, and now I, I, I see your, the, the, your image, I mean, the algorithms, the theories that what you are pulling out is, is relevant to any of us and all of us. So some of the things that really uh, stood out for me is you are also talking about the brain in your book and you speak about the sphere of possibilities. That was a biggie. And the other is you talk about spanning space. So I know that a lot of people that are here listening, like me, they're movers, perhaps movement practitioners, others who are manual therapists. I'm wondering if you can take this, is it an algorithm of spanning space? Would you call that an algorithm or would you call that a principle? And if you can talk more I about I, it. I wrote about it as a, as a right. It's, it's every being's right to span its own space. And um, I think when uh, it comes to body integrity, Okay, so let me just re-articulate. So we all have a right, kind of a, an inherent right yeah. to, to, to take up our own space. Yeah. Yes. So I think that spanning space that, as I'm interpreting this, that right to span space and take up our own space would be a principle and Will you please give us a, another example, as you did before, using people in, uh, and how I or others might experience that in our bodies? I know when we read it, we all ran with it. And I'd love to hear your perspective, maybe something you've experienced in your own body or something you've seen in others. So your, your perspective, your experience with spanning space and the power the huge power I think, loss. Um, I think it's it's easier to see in horses because most riding styles let the horses yield and not span their space. Although they all say they would like a big and strong horse, but they don't do anything to get a strong horse. Um, 
And if you transfer it to humans, you can say that you can see in um, you can see if the person is able to span its intellectual and emotional space, you can see that in the body. Mm -hmm. so someone is very like like this will not span its space emotionally and uh, uh, intellectual or and it's not so of often the that the physical space is too narrow. I think with human with human is on another. Uh, it's another dimension. Level? It's not physical. Dimension. Can can I can I share with people? I'm actually gonna and read from your book and a little bit. Yes. It, you say uh, and the subtitle is spanning space is an essential, fundamental, basic right. In the sphere of possibilities, there's no right or wrong, nor are there any given forms and processes. And just think about that mind shift, how it will impact us as people in our lives, because most of us didn't grow up with that. And you go on to say, the first step is to perceive both yourself and your horse as a tensegrity structure with a claim to span your own space. And Mar and I will share with you that even without a horse, this was super impactful. So you have questions then. How does my own space feel? Is it frayed, vague, and without clear boundaries? Is it very small and tight and therefore not able to communicate well? Is it more spacious than any material can endure in the long run? Or so tight that hardly any movement is possible? How do I react to push and pull? And how does the horse react? And what picture do I have of the correct reaction to push and pull? Can I keep going, Susan, or am I taking too hey, long? Yeah. No, 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 go ahead. This is great. And are you able to distinguish courtesy and manners from obedience and servility? And I would say not just with respect to horses, but also you know, in the dynamics of our culture. And what happens to the space of the horse? Spend some time with these simple questions. Take a look at how you spend your own space in life's situations, how this space responds to internal and external pressures. And I can say from my own experience that these are such profound questions. And Anna Kroll saying, wow, I need to buy the book. Um, Somebody can maybe put the title or a link into the chat because yes, Anna, this is an amazing book and Maren, you also tap into the brain. So these questions, I know you're, you're working with horses, but as a person who is mostly working with my own body and others, they're profound and profound in the way that I'm moving my body. I'm also hearing people talking about the 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 breath as spaciousness rather than deep or you know in yoga there's such an emphasis on sometimes over breathing take a deep breath and it's forced but rather observing the spaciousness of the breath mm -hmm. big shift and the this first thing about uh, um how did you put it you put how does my own space feel and the investigation into the boundaries of that space is huge for the psychosomatic experience yeah. Yeah. so um yeah i don't know if you want to say anything else i just really felt that people need to know this and uh <laughs> so i wanted to share because your book yeah. is amazing and it's good i you know I'm wondering if maybe now we're kind of getting into discussion, we can invite people to um, to turn on uh, their videos if they want. We can kind of go into the more casual mode. And then Maren, um, 
If you have anything to say in response to Chris, great. And whenever that's done and we're ready for the next thing, I'm gonna ask Doug to uh, chime in with his thoughts. And then I'm gonna ask George Roth to chime in with his. So we'll take it in that sequence if that's okay. Yes, I, can, I think we can have some, some questions. And I think what, what Chris was, uh, was reading, um, it, it's such a, big, such a big field for research. Um, it, it, it was just an invitation to, to look for more. That's great. Um, now I don't see Doug. So maybe he stepped away for a minute. So maybe we'll jump to George. Um, I'll just say that that Doug was saying in the chat, Marin, um, that you know you don't have to know everything about how a car engine works to know how to use, you know, the pedals, the steering wheels to be able to drive well. Right. We don't we don't become um, mechanics when we get our driver's license. We sort of, you know, <laughs> trust in what the others have put together and we learn to work with it from where we are. Um, so I think that's nice. I'll turn it over to you, George. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I have to uh, confess that, Marin, I just uh, browsed through your book this morning. I just purchased it online and been reading through it. Uh, so it's uh, beautifully laid out. You have some interesting uh, models and drawings. Um, I started working with horses over 25 years ago um, using my process of matrix repatterning. Uh, after a veterinarian approached me, um, one of my patients who wanted to learn about it and she took our course. And then I spent six months with her at the racetrack, which is a very <laughs> sad environment, I have to say, because uh, I was struck by how uh, brutally these horses were treated. Now she, she had her own horses, her family had horses. So of course they were treated well. But the first time I treated a horse and I, I sense your, your passion for them because I just absolutely was blown away by the experience because you know, when I work with a human, uh, for example, you know, they basically have uh, you know, this brain almost like a separation of mind body the horse, I, I, I immediately recognize that their entire body is a brain. Like it's like they're sensing on so many levels. And so when I felt the releases happening, um, it was very profound. I almost, I almost literally fell, fell down with the energy that was coming off of them. So I, I do admit to uh, being quite enamored of these beautiful creatures. So I understand that. Um, since then, we've had a number of veterinarians take the program, which has been great. And I've worked with a number of, you know, Olympic horses and, and uh, high level horses, dressage and jumpers and so on. Uh, one of the things that I wanted your opinion on, one thing that I, I wrote about many, many years ago, um, was the fact that I noticed at the racetrack that the horses were responding beautifully to the work and their, their whole conformation improved. Literally, you could measure the changes in the structure. You could actually see them, you could measure the girth and everything seemed to change and they performed really well. The problem is when they began training after a couple of weeks for a race, uh, many of these injuries returned and I kept on going back and realizing, tracing it down to the foot, to the legs. And so these very heavy structures, which are really uh, dense biotensegrity structures in the, in the long bones, and, uh, but the disruptive element that I kept tracing it back to was a horseshoe, the metal horseshoe and realizing that these horses were suffering from a loss of elasticity in their legs because the metal horseshoe did not allow the hoof to deform as Stephen talks about the expansion, the, you know, the, the earth contact, you know, push, pushing back and forth. They literally lost sensitivity, they lost elasticity and that force seemed to be transmitted up through the extremities. I started reading about, you probably heard of Hiltrich Strasser. She's one of your fellow country people. They're a veterinarian who studied the uh, influence of the horseshoe many years ago. And I didn't know anything about it until I looked for the information. So I wondered if that is an influence that you have taken into account, because uh, I think it's an area that is so 
unnatural to these animals. Um, it was introduced two or 3,000 years ago, the horseshoe, to keep the horse's foot out of the moisture so they wouldn't develop, you know, laminitis and, you know, infections, but from the... the so, George, yeah, George sorry. I, I promised Marin that I would step in and <laughs> the question so they're simple because... Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, language. It's so okay. Can, can, oh, I apologize. I'm, okay. I'm hearing, no, no, you didn't know. I made this mm -hmm. promise to Marin before we started. So <laughs> I'm wondering the question, would it be fair to say that your question is, I'm wondering how you are seeing and understanding the relationship between the horseshoe and the feet in horses and the, perhaps the ability for the the horses to maintain that level of health yeah, after exactly. the uh, Exactly, yeah. Or, that's was, that, was that simple enough? Was that good? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Um, I think um, race, racing horses do very extreme movements and the more extreme the movement is, the more important is that every part can do its job and um, shoot horses really miss the sense in their foot, I think. I'm quite sure. Um, but I'm, uh, it's, it's not my uh, main field. For me, it is important that if the horse is shooed, the the form of the hoof enables the horse to do the right movements because we often have a circle of uh, bad training and a shoeing that keeps the horse in these motion patterns. So for okay, me, so if there is mm -hmm. a shoeing, it should open the door to healthy movement patterns and not shut these doors okay I, but but for, my, I, mm -hmm, for okay. myself i i don't like um shoot uh, shoeing horse shoeing and yeah. i would avoid it if possible yeah 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 I, I i've worked on rehabilitating many horses getting the shoes off but they're so lame afterwards because they develop arthritis in the uh in the uh, uh, in the in the coffin bone and the pastern, and so on, and without the shoe, they don't develop this arthritis. That's been shown many times. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, I just wondered because that to me creates pain, and my experience with horses in pain is they become very aggressive, and people often say, "Well, my horse is a bad horse. It's you know, it's biting and kicking," and as soon as they're relieved of pain, they become docile. They become incredibly. Uh, gentle you know um because so, they... if you have a look at racing horses most um racing horses have quite flat hooves and they foot very far in the front and they foot quite flat and if there is an iron this this motion in the hoof can't take place and so that mm -hmm. happens what you said that mm -hmm. the issue is going up yeah. into the legs and sure comes to yeah I, I i would say that i don't just find that in race horses i found it since then in all kinds of horses like to me mm -hmm. it's irrespective of that this to me is not the natural state anyway i just wondered if you'd had experience with that and if you have considered that obviously you you have thought That's about great. it Okay, that's all. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And let me let me just say, so uh, Diane Woodruff has uh, something, and so does Carol Davis, um, and so does Eleanor Silverstein. But Eleanor, if yours is about the hoof and the shoeing and all of that um, that we're talking about right now, we can take yours first, or is it about something else? It is. Okay, go ahead, because Eleanor's worked with horses for. 40. The last 40 something years. Yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, working with Linda Tellington Jones and doing the Tellington Equine Awareness Movement, which became T-Touch. And the, the touch 
of the work is so much around the idea of biotensegrity, but we never knew it until only recently. And in the last couple of years of getting to be with this group, I keep running back and calling Linda on the phone going, oh my God. So when we do the touch like this, this is this part of biotensegrity. But so I'm very, very excited. But as, as Dr. Stephen Levin would say, we should be careful not to become too dogmatic. And as a good Jew, we would say on the one hand and on the other hand. So <laughs> on the one hand, right? <laughs> There's more than one side to each thing. So yes, you know, shoes do this and do that, just like with people. On the other hand, these animals, these great animals are very malleable and they are, uh, cause I grew up next to the Santa Anita racetrack. And so I worked with many horses on the racetrack and the problem we see is not so much the shoes as much as it's the quality of the racetrack, which is where they're talking about the horses breaking down and getting injured. But that being said, they're on the track out of the whole day, a very small amount of time compared to the rest of the day. And when I lived back East in Washington, DC, and I worked with horses in Maryland on the breeding farms and horses that actually, one of my horses uh, came in first in the Kentucky Derby after we, I gave him lessons. But here's the thing, Dr. George Roth, what we did is I taught not just me working on the horse, I taught the groom how to do this beautiful work on the horse. And I taught the trainer to understand the touch, the sensation, the experience, the feeling. And so what happened was these horses that I came in with only a handful of times, but everybody else in the environment kept that same good work going on good enough, um, they didn't break down. Just a they quick comment. Can I, can I respond to that very quickly? They've done a lot to try to improve the track to compensate for this. But in Australia, they largely run barefoot. And horses, a typical racehorse in North America, is finished by the time it's four or five years old. In Australia, for sure. they're, in Australia they're running well into their teens. Barefoot, absolutely. And they come in literally in the top of the ranks. And okay, so, so maybe you're, living, you're day, looking at it in a narrow perspective, perhaps, because you're working within the framework of horses expected to be shod. And that is a big problem for the horse, in my opinion. Sure. And, and I get it. And I understand it's the same as us as humans wearing uh, inserts in the shoes. But what I'm trying to say is when we use the idea of biotensegrity within their framework at this time in what is happening in North America within that framework, within the horses, we can use these principles of biotensegrity until they change their ethics, yeah, until they change their mechanical thing. Yeah. There's still a lot that this touch and way that Marin talks about, God bless you, that are all these ways that can help these horses until that next step in humanity happens. Well, so there's still okay. a lot that we can do. Okay. There's a, there, just quickly, there's a large group of people who are doing barefoot trimming. The Romans and Mongols conquered the known world on horseback without shoes. The Romans deliberately put their horses in, in a paddock with river rocks to stimulate the hoof to improve circulation and flexibility before a campaign. And they traveled over mountain passes and across vast distances and uh, the endurance horses are never shod. Think about that. There's a reason why people know that horses traveling 100 miles a day, if you shod them, they would be destroyed within the first 10 miles. And, so it's um, a huge issue. Uh, They're in constant stop. pain. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> it's a no, big I, issue. We I, lose tensegrity. We I'm lose that so flexibility. Sorry. The hoof is a tensegrity structure too. We have to yeah, just remember that. The shoe disrupts that. Sorry. And I'd love I'm to hear what Marn has to say. Cause yeah, okay. I'll also I mean, maybe just well. say, Steve is saying shoeing a person has similar problems to shoeing uh, horses. And if you look in Everything Moves, if you have my book, the whole 
in the systems chapter, that's where I put the stuff on bare. But try it, try it, try it, try it in a metal shoe. You'll be surprised yeah, how much worse exactly, it is. Exactly, because because the shoes yeah. it, it change yeah. your the system. You're in system with the earth when you're walking around as our totally. horses. So, Marin, let let's pass it back over to you then. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it happens what always happens when most people discuss. We we come too far too far away from um, the main thing, and the main thing is that. If Genghis Khan had needed so much time to care for his horses, he had horse steak and stayed at home. So nowadays we have so much time to spend with therapy and the best food and the best shoes and changing the, the uh, hoof, um, hoof figure every every uh, half a year and uh, we have a saddle for every horse whatever its conformation is and uh, we have <laughs> bridles and bits and and whatever it's it's a whole industry and no one looks how a horse could do its job, so it's just doing its job. Yes. When, when so look, and let and me... the, step, the bounds around every every second person is a, a, a horse physiotherapist, osteo. Uh, everyone. Is, is a professional around horses and that's uh, in incredible. So this is the saddle industry. Yeah. Usually you can ride the whole stable or all your horses with two saddles, one for the young horses and one for the educated horses. And that's it because they fill the space you give them. And I think yeah. the discussion always goes the wrong way. And we have some questions coming up that relate to that, Marin. Um, first, just to keep uh, the line and not get lost, um, Diane Woodruff had a comment and then Carol Davis had a question. Uh, so Diane, are you going to unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maren. Um, I am uh, wanting to ask about spanning space. I thought I understood that you are saying this is how the person, the horse, the two, two together occupy space. Um, uh, then I, I shift to a Laban perspective in which the kinosphere, which is all the space around the body and which, and which travels with us, is a dynamic place of, um, of uh, bouncing molecules and energy. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a place to relate to. So, and all movement, all body movement occurs in space. Um, so, but we can occupy it, we can use it or we can ignore it. Um, and is spanning space about occupying that space? using it mindfully, functionally? Is that a question? <laughs> ah. So go, just going back to spanning space, yeah. is, is the idea of spanning space about occupying space or is it about something else? And, and I'll say, you I know- is, I think it is both because yeah. um, you have to, uh, span, span your space is also um, something um, physical to keep your body's integrity. And occupy for me is a little bit uh, 
for, for me, I'm not a native speaker. It sounds as if that occupied space is a space I took from another one. Uh, no, uh, fill, fill the space. Yeah. To be, to be in the space, to live in space. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, Maren, you know how in Daniel Claude's book, she has the picture of people with the kinosphere from Laban, you know, where they're inside the structures. And I know, that, like that's, I know that's just one, uh, um, one piece of that, yeah. Diane, and it's not at all complete, but that Maren, I think what Diane's talking about is you know, the willingness, mm -hmm. the willingness to expand as needed. Or, or not, depending on the, the use, the need of it, okay? Depending on, right, as needed, depending on what, what's called for. Yeah. yeah. Mara? I think that the expanding, expanding space came from this um, picture of horses that are all collapsing under okay. the riders and among the apes, they are okay. collapsed. And so they have the right to spend their space to use their body to carry a rider in the first place. Yes. And um, if you see it in general, you always have to say um, a tentacular structure always Hold its space. Yes, it has volume. Against push against push and pull. Yes, yes. So a horse that is only expanding will lose its own feet. Right. So it also has to keep yes. the legs um, under control. Yes, yes. Okay, so you are always, talking always both, and the, the picture of spending that space was originally uh, the concept to against the, these pictures of collapsing horses. Yes. So what what Colin Martin says about the spaciousness in the body, it's volume, it's volume, and you're saying that the, the horse has can lose that, that inner sense of spaciousness and volume. And that's what you mean by spanning space. Yeah. Yes, very helpful. And that it's done with connection to the earth and that whole body integrity, would you say? Yes, I think what, what Diane, uh, uh, Danielle said about um, the volume is, um, that there is a volume that is fine and it can be too much and it can be too too small mm -hmm. so and every living being has i think one relaxed optimum right and the the actual size changes in the interaction with life Yes, yes, it's not, and in, in the, the human, it's not about, it isn't about size, you, yes, it is about your sense of self in the space. Yeah. And you want, you want the horse, and, I, and I, I'm thinking that a, a person without that sense of space, self in, in the space will then have an effect on the horse. Mm -hmm. Because the horse knows, and the horse knows everything about you, you know, when you get on it, right? That's great. Thank you. Um, and I'll just say before we go to Carol, and thank you, Diane, that um, if you don't have Danielle Claude Martin's book, you need that one too, folks. Uh, it's really, um, it will serve you well to have that. Uh, to have that in, in addition to, to there we go. Uh, there's really a lot in there about, yes, there, Michelle, everybody's got, here's my copy. Great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'm going to pass it over to you, Carol, because we've got several other questions in the line and we're going to try to get to every one of them. 
Well, thanks. Um, Maren, um, it, it's, your talk was great. I loved it. I love the model. I love thinking about the model as it applies to human beings. And I love your book. And the piece that I love that I wanted to bring today to you is about resilience. When you talk about resilience and um, the, the horse's response meaningful response to pressure. Um, and you said you can, you stand on the side of your horse and put your hands on the right and left side of the saddle and apply slight pressure forward, downward direction. And, and there are five possible reactions that the horse can give you. So you're able to do this without getting up on the horse. You're able to do this standing beside the horse to get an idea of who is this horse and how is this horse going to respond to things that I'm going to give it. And um, it reminded me of the importance of in physical therapy, <coughs> how the young physical therapists often, a person comes in with low back pain and they show all these, like say five signs of low back pain. So, okay, here's a person with these five signs. I'm always gonna do this, 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 because that's what the literature tells me to do. Without even putting your hands on a person, just put them in a protocol and do what the literature says. And that's good physical therapy. And it, this reminds me so much of what happens with horses. But what I wanted to, to ask you about particularly was my most meaningful experience. I don't have a lot of experience with horses, but I did do a course in Barnes myofascial release with horses. And it was, and I have a similar experience with dogs. When I'm doing pressure into the biotensegral system to add what I think might be necessary in this space, sometimes, often, the horse or the dog turns to look at me with a look that is absolutely stunning. And I think everybody who's worked with horses now knows what I'm talking about. There is a connection, an energetic connection with this animal that goes way beyond placebo, of course. And the animal is telling me directly, thank you. That's exactly what I needed. Yes. <laughs> and so when you talk about resilience, one of the things that struck me when you said, when you talked about this pressure, what does the horse need? How is the horse going to respond previous, because of the nature of the horse, because of the biotensegrity makeup of the horse, because of the horse's bad experiences with other people? And then you say, you're looking for um, a, a, a horse that, that, that is able to um, uh, expand under against pressure of any kind is a basic attitude, an attitude of life. And this exercise is an indicator of whether the horse has understood what it is about, the healthy, harmonious resistance against pressure of your hands suggests a healthy physical and mental resilience. This resilience should increase, not decrease, during training. And then you go on to say, and this is what caught my eye, um, anyone who can feel whether the horse answers pressure using his tensegrity structure and who can request this reaction of, in the horse at any time avoids the risk of overburdening his horse or damaging him doing pathogenic movements. Also, horses which are already damaged can recapture this capacity if their heart is still in it. And that to me is poetry because it tells me you have had the experience of taking a damaged horse and finding the heart that's still in it and bringing that horse to the place where you and the horse are in this partnership, your biotensegrity, the horse's biotensegrity, 
And I wonder, did you, do you get looks like that? You must get looks from the animal like that of where have you been my whole life? And wouldn't it be wonderful if all of our patients felt that from us? Where have you been? Why don't all physical therapists treat me the way you do? And so you, 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 you beautifully describe this. And I wonder if you would tell us a story or, or describe to us an experience you've had where that happened. I, I, can, I can tell stories, but I'm not a therapist. So there are other situations and sometimes they are really funny. And I was in a, in a barn um, for a workshop and there was one horse heavy black um, horse standing close to the riding arena, eyes half closed. And um, I was told, yes, uh, she does lessons with kids and but she doesn't uh, trot well and she doesn't like to gallop and there is no right hand galloped and uh, we don't know <laughs> and uh, they brought that horse into the arena and I thought okay um, I wanted to, to launch it and I started the horse and while the owner told me that the horse is not able to gallop right hand, the horse looked at me, said, no, and gallop perfectly right hand. <laughs> and this horse that didn't move and that didn't want to walk and trot and gallop was like, like a Spanish. Stallion. It was a mare mm. of oh. 21, and she trot like a stallion, and I... I can um, picture it. I, I gave her free, so she had the whole arena, and she was uh, trotting around, galloping, really like, like, a, like a stallion, <laughs> and said to me, I don't think that I'm the problem. <laughs> I'm not the problem here, right? <laughs> it's never the horse that's the problem. I love but it. How do you how do you, how do you then pass on to the owner? Look, this is what you're doing I wrong. In this in this case, I just told them that this was need half an hour a week for itself in the arena just to move. Just and to try. they did it and she she wrote to me later that the horse was completely another horse since that workshop. It it really changed because they could see that the horse changed like that. Yeah, his horse thing, part was still in it. And when yes, and when someone is launching the horse and I'm just standing behind that person. Uh, and I'm not that patient sometimes, and uh, I think, hmm, I don't like what I see, and I know there is more in that horse. Uh, I just put my hand on, on the launch, and <laughs> the, motor, the motor started, and I put my hand up. Hey, Maren. I don't do anything. I just have my hand in this connection and everything changes. Maren, Mari, can you come a little closer to the mic the way you were yes, before? Okay. Sorry, I think it helps. Yeah. That reminds me of Mariana, when Mariana touches the child and the child responds from yeah. knowing where to push, where to put the pressure, exactly what to add to the mix in order to get the fascia to come home to itself and respond in support. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 it's much, uh, um, many horses have 
sort of left their body and if they come back it's really it's great <laughs> um, thank you thank, thank you carol we have a question from uh ruth um ruth i think your question's important you can unmute i think Okay, uh, apologies, my daughter's in the background, so I'll, I will re-mute if she's naughty. But um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marin and Carol, for your wonderful, um, Carol, your description of working with horses, because uh, I, I studied horse equine massage and um, I got a, a lovely diploma and I always felt a little bit that I wasn't following the protocol so much as just following the horse when I'm working. And I love your description of the horse looking at you. And um, I work I work in the Alps with athletes and mountaineers, but sometimes people's dogs are presented to me and I have to work with the dog. And it's very humbling because the dog gives you their trust and you have to follow. And um, I, I, I've always erred away from energetic, you know, discussions, but I do feel the dogs definitely draw you into their story. And you, you know, they're, they're not a dog they are a client and uh, I talk to them like I talk to a client but that's an aside that's not my question it's just I'm really inspired and um, I think if you do any courses Mara now I'm going to look you up um, but my question was I, again Susan says it is relevant it was about um, the bits uh, I'll see what I wrote and um, uh, when I was studying I got really confused as to why we still all insist of you on using a bit, um, which I work, you know, when I ride horses, yes, they, you know, they go beautifully on the bit and sometimes, um, but as I understand, they're obturate nasal breathers. So they need to breathe, especially at speed through their noses. Um, and surely then that, and again, I don't know, it's really biotensegrity, but um, they, I don't understand why we don't use bitless bridles why that hasn't been developed. Um, so that's really my question. But at the same time, I, you know, I, I would bridle the horse and they go, hmm, lovely. They take the bit. So I'm not trying to argue one point or the other. I'm just really confused. If that, hopefully that's not too confusing a question. Um, I think that a strong and healthy horse becomes better when it carries the bit because the core fascia ends up in the tongue. And if the horse is able to carry that bit on that tongue, the whole core is activated. If you use a bit to make the horse yield, take its nose down and whatever that doesn't work and that's the wrong way. But I just had it, I, I do some um, video coaching at the moment and there was one woman with a, with a young horse and um, I talked about that with her and she just, tried it and asked the horse what it thinks about and this horse really said yummy concept is clear let's do it like that and if it's like that it's easy for the horse and it um, matches the principles and the algorithms So that's um, the one thing. And if uh, you start a horse and maybe you are not that safe rider yourself, uh, it might be better to have a, a, a bit less soft bridle because we also have these bit less bridles with rope with hard rope and uh, raw leather things like like bozars, they are not soft and the horse can't stretch against it. 
So you always have to look what's the horse like, what's the rider like, and what can they do together. Marin, are you saying that because that bitless bridle has a harder piece, it provides the, the sort of compressive communication ele element that's clear as opposed to something that's soft and squishy that no, would the, interfere with the, the signal? The problem is these hard bitless bridles are on the bone. There's no flesh, no fat there on the bone, and it hurts. And so the, her the horse can't do the same as it can do with a can't lean bit into on it. the tongue. Yes. Because the tongue is flesh. So in a, no, in a tensegrity, we don't want to touch the hard parts. The, the, the hard parts touch each other. So yeah. if I want to connect with my horse, I should not um, make contact between compression elements. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Maria, she had a couple of comments uh, that relate to several of the things we've been talking about. So Maria, could you jump in a minute? Hello. Thank you. Um, I actually, I'm taking notes like a lunatic and I'm not sure anymore what I, I wanted to ask because now with the um, this uh, theory about the bits, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I, maybe I can start there. I also work with horses and, and dogs, Marin, and um, um especially in a post in a, a hospital environment so i see loads of spinal dogs and one of the difficulties that um and mariana has been helping me so much uh, but one of the main difficulties we have with the post uh, spinal dogs is that they are unable to um engage their core i don't know if if if, if you know that's your theory about the beast being being i suppose in a biotensorical way, we can say a lever, but a, a support to the to that line would be, I don't know, it would be a possibility to 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 explore. That's one. Uh, but the main, the, the other one that I had with it was your um, concept about the volume is so interesting, and I do see it all the time with with our patients. Um, but I wonder if, um, because there is such a necessity to do something about, I suppose, the welfare of our animals, or at least is what I, what I see that horses, we've been, I, we've been submissing them for so long uh, that we don't see, I suppose, sometimes the brutality of of what we do with them. Um, so, for example, in the hospital, uh, the, we, if we see horses that have kissing spines and arthritis in their spinous processes, one of the main, um, one of the established treatments is to cut the spinous processes. And um, this is the veterinary uh, caring world that we live now. Uh, so, it's just so insane to think that that is the established and the norm to treat um, to treat this this condition, and um, so I think I have a necessity to to start proving that the biotensegral way and the fascia is so important, but I don't know how to even start. And maybe the volume, the, the concept of the volume, if we could perhaps uh, see postural and also within the tissues through, I don't know, ultrasound or um, other means, if we could see that the tissues also expand, do you think that something like that can happen? So when you're, you're saying that they're filling up the space, surely they do change their posture. Like you see it, they, you know, they carry, they, they, their top line increases, their withers, 
um, you, they're not as defined, their neck, uh, it's, you know, they hold themselves better, their scapulas and shoulder blades move forward. Um, so maybe there is also a way to prove that that volume is happening. That's... And I think if you, if you work with animals, um, especially with horses, the job description is very important. So you have to decide of the, if you have a patient or if you have a horse that tries to do its job. And you will have better results if you can tell the horse um, that it has to carry a blanket you put on its back then telling the horse how to, um, what's the right posture. So if you can find the words for the job, mm -hmm. the horse will behave in another way. And for, for my dog, for instance, he was um, in the in the right shoulder, a little bit too soft for my taste. And um, we, we have the command, strong dog. And then he makes this and pushes himself away from me instead of pulling the leg. So, I think it would be a good way for you to try um, what jobs the animals can accept and understand. But I also wonder in terms of measuring, I don't know if you have a thought on this, Steve, I almost am saying if Maria and the horse or the dog are in a swimming pool or something where we could measure the, the, the volume change, you know what I mean? So that if all of a sudden the horse expands uh, omnidirectionally as it, as it kind of develops its healthy structure, you know, the water level would rise, right? So there, there'd be a way of, because of course you're, you're working Maria in a research environment where everybody wants to quantify things. Uh, so <laughs> I, think, I, I think that would be an, an, an interest, uh, interesting uh, setup for research. But I think in these collapsed horses, um, when they collapse in one part of the body, they expand in another one. Every horse that collapses in the back has a big belly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so they're, they're Compen the volume goes somewhere else. So they're, they're uh, compensating maybe with excess tension in another system in order to make up for the support they're lacking as they become I less think, integrated? I think the, the structures in a healthy horse that keep the belly together just slack in a collapsed horse, because these collapsed horses, um, in most cases, have an open lumbar sacral joint, so the pelvis is steeper, mm -hmm. and the <laughs> anatomy, um, it comes down and closer Take to them. the sternum. So the way from the sternum to the pelvis is shorter, but the fascia is not. And that's why they all have these big bellies, big hanging bellies. So the volume goes somewhere. That's great. Um, I, go um, ahead, Maria, sorry, go ahead. I just, um, wonder like because um 
all horses or most of the horses that we see are ridden and then they probably are stabled and they definitely wouldn't have much opportunity to do other movements rather than they are the ones that are trained for. Um, I suppose that that is why they start developing this arthritis, you know, that you wouldn't see in dogs and you wouldn't see in humans um, in, I don't know, six years old horses. Like they're not, they don't have had time to develop such severities, but it's because we write them, I think anyway, um, in, in always in the same pattern. So if they're dressed as horses, they go to the arena, they do the dress as work, back to the stables. If they jump, they jump, you know, and so on. So what I notice when, when I am treating them, and it doesn't really matter where I'm treating them, I can be treating them in the pole, I can be treating them in their, in their chests and one hand and just behind the withers. I feel like the, the, where the saddle goes, which is usually collapsed, it starts filling up. Uh, mm -hmm. And you do see the quivers of the muscle and you suddenly start seeing a top line. And posturally, I think I noticed that their scapulas, you know, that they, they short, they, yeah, their scapulas are more winging. They're not, mm -hmm. yeah, they're not as bow like, a, like, a, yeah, like that. They become a little bit more like so. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, mm -hmm. that would be a place that, you see it, but that the tissues are also changing. And, and yes, unfortunately I do, well, not unfortunately work in this research environment, but I think it's the, the whole veterinary world, it's determined by this environment. So unless we are able to talk the same language or to prove that Biotensegrity is also something tangible. The horses are going to keep suffering <laughs> for a long time until they find a good professional like you, Marin, and you know, um, and Carol, like someone that can help them. But 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 the change, the global change, is going to take longer because they the surgeons are still going to think, oh yes, oh look, a few bones, let's take it out and problem solved. But I think the, the global change is um, the key for the for a global change is the lumbar sacral joint and the changes in the motion patterns you get when when that works. And I have already three videos finished about that topic, very short ones. Um, but they are in German. Ah. <laughs> I need someone to translate it. It's not enough time. Um, Maybe you'll get a volunteer. Yes. Ruth, so, Ruth yeah. do you speak German, French, English? Many. And I, I also did these uh, videos about the levers in the horse. Uh, they are for free, so if you if you like to watch them, they are on my YouTube channel. Um, yes, and in the newsletter that we sent out, uh, there is the link uh, that will get you to the splash page uh, for Marin's YouTube channel, so you can choose your uh, your videos. Um, now we have we have comments in the chat that I can't tell whether they're questions, um, but I think we're getting close to two hours now. So I'm wondering, I don't know if Graham is ready to thank sponsors again, but maybe what we should do is, is wind things up and go into um, after party mode. What does everyone think? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, over to you, Graham. Thanks, Susan. I'll give a quick run through of the, the sponsors. Handspring Publishing, Embodied Biotensegrity, The Fascia Hub, Matrix Repatterning, Integrated Biotensegrity, Artifact Pro, Pretensed, 
and the Second World Fascia Congress. All details can be found in the chat. Uh, don't forget the Fascia Hub, tomorrow's event, the Fascial Foot. Uh, so you haven't got long to sign in for that. So back to you, Susan. I jump in, Graham. Yes. But, and, and also don't forget uh, the Bruce Hamilton stuff, which is also, I think, uh, I hope in the chat. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say Bruce Hamilton and also the Embodied Biotensegrity platform is now Gwen Cornish and I, and we are going to have a couple of Zoom sessions free, inviting people to come on and have discussions. We want to get to know people in the smaller setting. So I'll put the link for the registration up there, or you can join us on Facebook and find it. Great. So that'll be next week. Thanks. And uh, for anyone who came in late, we also have an invitation to join a small group, um, sort of instant, short-term, big biotensegrity interest group around the subject of stretching. Um, and there's a link uh, in the chat, or we can put it in again to um, to a page that you can go to to enter your information if you want to jump in on that conversation so we can identify some of the issues that have come up recently and sort of where we are, what is the state of the, the field, what's the awareness, what are the shared definitions, what are the not shared definitions, all of those things, what's the research telling us? Uh, so we've got that as well. And um, it sounds like from what I'm hearing, we could have a, an online big just around um, equine therapy, uh, equestrianism in general. How do you pronounce it? Farriery? Uh, you know, shoeing and shotting of horses and all of those things. Um, but I'll leave that to the community for another day. Um, and so, Maren, I want to say thank you. I'm going to um, ask Steve, would you mind toasting us out? Steve, you have to unmute, my friend. It'll be my pleasure to the world around us from you know, viruses to vertebrates. They all seem to be doing the same thing. And congratulations to them all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for the horses. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Maren. Cheers. And Michelle is here, Susan. Is Michelle's tea parties next week, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week we'll have uh, we'll we'll see Michelle and uh, Selena Huang will be there to to do the translation and help out with that. It will be our first French and English uh, bilingual tea party, so that's kind of fun. Michelle, did you want to say anything? Oh. Um... I'm so happy uh, first to have uh, heard uh, Maren this uh, evening. It was uh, very clear for me, the message, because I am nearer, uh, I'm nearer uh, um, by the horses uh, because of my granddaughter who is uh, riding. And also I gave uh, two treatments to uh, horses with uh, my biointensegrity uh, um, way of life <laughs> and it works so well and uh, I, uh, uh, I am really um, it's very warm for me to to hear about uh, what you do uh, to uh, reveal to the horses their own space and to give them back their freedom, something uh, for me uh, is very deep uh, emotion to hear you and uh, thank you, Marin. And uh, it was a very beautiful uh, comments I love. <laughs> thank you. All right, so we'll see you next week, Michelle. And yeah. thank you to everyone. See you.
Okay, shall we say goodbye to our YouTube audience? And exactly.